Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and any, everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes even the future. Sometimes it's just what we think the future should be, and if it becomes the future, so much the better. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, Volume 2 being written right now. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles-related interviews and stuff. You definitely want to check it out. Ken, how's it going? Going great, Alan. Looking forward to uh, a new show, our first in several weeks here. Mm. And this will be fun. Yeah. And Darren DeVivo, who has been a DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area since February 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. How are you, Ken? Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us once again. Um, so today we have, I don't know what you would call it, not quite a game, sort of a game. Um, it's something Ken has done on some of his other shows, and um, it's called Rack My Brain after a famous Ringo Starr song, um, in which we ask each other opinion questions without any preparation, like the other two don't know the questions I'm going to ask and the same all around. Um, they probably won't be all that difficult anyway. They're opinion questions, so there's no wrong answers. But before we get to that, we have the news, which Ken will deliver. And um, for those of you who skip the news, some people have said they do. No. Uh, yeah, apparently. Come on. Um, Within the news, we're going to be actually talking about a couple of um, recent releases and things. So if you care about that, stay tuned for the news. Ken? Okay. There's quite a lot to get to since it's been several weeks since uh, the last show. On August the 22nd, it was announced that Ringo's next EP, his fourth EP, Rewind Forward, is coming out October 13th. It'll be a digital release, also available on cassette, CD, and 10-inch vinyl. The title track was made available to stream or purchase everywhere last Friday, August the 25th. This EP includes four songs, and one is actually written by Paul McCartney. The four songs are Shadows on the Wall, which was written by Steve Lukather with Joseph Williams, who also worked with Steve and Toto, and Ray Williams, um, there's a song called Feeling the Sunlight. That's the one that Paul McCartney has written. There's the title track, Rewind Forward, written by Ringo and his co-producer and co-writer for several years now, Bruce Sugar. And a song called Miss Jean, which was written by Mike Campbell of the Heartbreakers. Ringo was quoted as saying, Rewind Forward was something I said out of the blue. It's just one of those lines like a hard day's night. It just came to me, but it doesn't really make sense. I was trying to explain it to myself, and the best I can tell you about what it means is sometimes when you want to go forward, you have to go back first. The song Rewind Forward was written with his engineer and off co writer Bruce Sugar. He said, We've been writing a song now for every EP, and this EP includes collaborations, like I said, with Paul McCartney, Steve Lukather, Joe Williams. Joe Walsh is on there, Ben Montench, and Mike Campbell. Ian Hunter makes an appearance. Uh, Steve Dudas, Lance Morrison, Matt Bissonette, that's Greg's brother, uh, Torrance Klein, Weston Wilson, and two guys whose last name happens to be Lennon. Kip and Marky Lennon. All the songs are recorded at Ringo's home studio in Los Angeles, with the exception of the McCartney song, which was mainly done in the UK. Remember, uh, Ringo will be back on the road with his all-star band for dates in the U.S. starting September 17th, running through October 
the 13th. And since this song has been available now online and digitally for a few days now, rewind forward. You guys have any uh, comments about what you think of the song? Darren, why don't we start with you? I think it's great. I think it might be. I have to listen to it again and maybe maybe listen to the other EPs also. But it struck me from the first listen as maybe one of the better songs, if not the best song from the EPs collectively. I wow. really liked it. It, it was, um, you know, as, as is the case, a lot with Ringo's songs. Lyrically, it's simple, but this one's got some lyrical twists to it. I was paying close attention, dissecting. And, and just thought the whole thing was very clever and a nice way to introduce the EP. So I was very happy with it. And um, now, of course, uh, the other thing that I think is more, and I'm surprised it's not getting more attention, is is feeling the sunlight. Uh, this is a brand new Paul McCartney song. Mm. Uh, and this was something that happened fairly often back in the day, back in the 70s. Ringo would put out an album that was a Paul song. John would give a song or two. George would be, you know, would write a song specifically for the project. And that went, That I mean, that was, you know, some of the stuff that uh, ended up on right up to Stop and Smell the Roses. Lennon, had he not been murdered, was going to take these songs he had and they were going to record together for the next Ringo record. And uh, so this is sort of re reminiscent of, of of the of those releases of those times that now here we are in 2023 and Ringo's putting out some new music and one of them is a McCartney song. I'm assuming Paul wrote for Ringo. I don't know if it's something that he's had laying around. We we may eventually find out. Wings mm. rehearsed it like 50 years ago and it's been <laughs> sitting in you know a box somewhere. But I'm I'm looking forward to it and, and the title track's a great introduction to the EP and. I thought it was a really good song. It, it caught me more than anything, I think, on his last EP. Caught me, my attention, I think, I'd say. Yeah, um, that's a good point you make there, Darren, because, you know, Paul has appeared on Ringo's albums as a musician. Right. <laughs> since Stop and Smell the Roses. But the songwriting end, no. I mean, uh, they wrote together, say, um, Really Love You on Flaming Pie. They wrote the song together. But as far as what Paul has written for Ringo, you'd really have to go back to Stop and Smell the Roses. Yeah. There was that one song that Paul and Ringo wrote together, which they didn't release from the Time Takes Time sessions. Mm. So, but as far as a song that Paul donated to Ringo, um, Stop and Smell the Roses, he had private property on there at attention. So, um, so you have... It's actually pretty cool because you got, as you mentioned, all the songwriters, Ken. Shadows mm -hmm. on the Wall is written by two of the guys from Toto. And then you've got two of the guys from the Heartbreakers because Ben Montench, what I'm looking at gives Ben Montench co-writing credit with Mike Campbell on Miss Jean. So you got two Heartbreakers, two Toto, and Ringo get, contributing his own song and some guy named Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice, nice uh, collection of tunes. Now, he had hinted at uh, the... Uh, the next EP was it Linda Perry had yes, and she wrote be, all the material or is as far as I know she wrote all the material and produced and is producing it, and then then we get the T Bone Burnett Country Project uh huh next year right or well, both of them maybe next year but okay you'd have to wait till at least well <laughs> after the the latest tour the U S dates before we get the the second and third new EPs. All right. Ken, does Ringo perform Rewind Forward during this leg of this current tour? <laughs> Based on what Mark Rivera said to us, no. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. It's really... It, you know, one of your questions, does it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that would be a very obvious answer then. Um, yeah. I mean, I brought up something like, what's my name? how easy it would be to perform a yeah. song like what's my name when that's what he shouts out to the crowd in all this shows anyway. So, um, Alan, your thoughts about the song Ringo's new song. 
I basically liked it too. Um, I thought the the opening had this nice tactile thing going on before it just sort of became, you know, a sort of a solid rock track. Um, it has the sound that many Ringo things since Time Takes Time have had. You know, it has that uh, just that same feeling. It's it's sort of as if you you know you can break his career into sections and that that begins a section time takes mm. time. Um, and this is, you know, quite clearly from the post time takes time period. It has, you know, he's in, and he's been into, especially since that album, uh, sort of nice positive messages. And this is one of those, uh, you know, maybe a couple of cliches in there like reach for the stars but you know but um you know i mean basically it, it is a positive message overall and it and uh that's a good thing he he seems to like putting out positive vibes to the world and uh so this is his latest effort at that um yeah. it's an enjoyable song it's an enjoyable song not a lot else to say about it I, I have to hear it a few more times i've heard it like three or four times um but i also am looking forward to hearing it in the context of the full ep you know right and particularly waiting to hear paul's song <laughs> and i kind of feel the same way as you do alan um when i first listened to it it sounded like so many other ringo songs from his EPs and Ringo has been preaching peace and love and a positive message for a long time. And most of his songs lyrically, the ones that he writes are just that, and this is no different. And it's very catchy. The chorus is very catchy and I like it a lot, you know, um, just to give you an idea, I did write down the words of the chorus. Um, every day there's a new horizon everywhere, another mountain to climb. Every day, another lesson to learn. Everywhere, another page to turn. Reach for the stars. Rewind forward. And you do have Joe Walsh on there on guitar, as you have Steve Dudas and Matt Bissonette. Like I said, Greg's brother playing the bass on that. Very enjoyable song. And, um, you know, we're, we're at a stage here where with Paul and Ringo, I'm just grateful that they're doing anything. And um, every new release is an event for me. And that is just as important as the music at this point, you know, because they don't have to do anything. And just knowing that they still enjoy the whole recording process is reason enough for me to appreciate what they're giving us now. But I do like the song a lot and uh, looking forward to hearing the other three songs. All right. Um, on Friday, August 18th, the new single from Dolly Parton was available digitally and for streaming. And it's her cover of the Beatle classic, Let It Be. Dolly has a new double album coming out November 17th called Rockstar. And it's all covers of classic rock songs with many legendary artists joining her for the album. This new version of Let It Be has Paul McCartney adding harmonies and singing and answering back the words Let It Be. Ringo Starr is also on the record, as are Peter Frampton, who does the lead guitar solo, and Mick Fleetwood. Paul is quoted as saying, thanks, Dolly, for doing my song. I love your version, and I'm very pleased to be by your side on this one. Rock on. Love, Paul. And Dolly said, well, does it get any better than singing Let It Be with Paul McCartney, who wrote the song? Not only that, he played piano. Well, it did get even better when Ringo Starr joined in on drums, Peter Frampton on guitar, and Mick Fleetwood playing percussion. I mean, seriously, how much better does it get? Thanks, guys. And Dolly also said that originally when she made the cover of Let It Be, there was a different drummer on the record. But after recording Paul's vocals, they thought, why not replace the drummer with Ringo? Dolly said, and so that's what we did, because I thought, wow, that would be all the Beatles. No, all the Beatles today. But, um, you know, I'm very happy, first of all, that Dolly made that comment about Mick Fleetwood on percussion because we heard that Ringo and Mick Fleetwood, Mick Fleetwood are on it. So I didn't know if maybe there's double drumming or, or what, if it would be just Ringo on drums. But this uh, clears the issue on that, that Ringo is the drummer on the song. And it's great, as, as always, to hear Peter Frampton doing lead guitar work. And... Um, so what did you guys think of this brand new version of uh, Let It Be? 
Alan? Um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward version. Uh, no eccentricities or anything like that. It's it's uh, it's pleasant. It's uh, you know, it's fun hearing Paul's answering uh, vocals with her. I, I, I like Dolly Parton, um, and uh, you know, I'm glad she's done this album with all of the rockers um, because. Uh, I mean, I think at one point she said something like, well, okay, they put me in the Rock Hall of Fame, which at first, as you remember, she asked not to be because she didn't feel that she really was a rock person. And uh, then she said, okay, they, they put me in the Rock Hall of Fame, and so I might as well make a rock album, so I deserve to be in there. And and she's uh, collaborating with an awful lot of people, and uh, you know, her voice is still in great shape. Um do you know when her relationship with Paul goes back to? Hmm. Well, I know this is not the first record that they made together because there's an album that Cat Stevens made something hmm. like 10 years ago. And one of the bonus tracks um, is a song called Boots and Sand. And Paul sings on the record with Dolly Parton on hmm. the Cat Stevens song. But I would imagine probably something to do in the Beatle years. Maybe they met. Nope. It's in volume two coming up. <laughs> <laughs> they met in Nashville when he was working on oh, that would make sense. Yeah. stuff that he did in Nashville with, with wings. Uh, they, oh. they, you know, they took a, a month or so to rehearse and they did some recording there, but one of the things that was going on is Dolly Parton uh, was performing there and, you know, she had just had a, a number of hits that year and they hadn't seen her before. And uh, they went to the show and they were all of wings enthusiastic about getting to meet her. And, uh, and that's, that's where it goes back to. So a little bit of trivia there for you. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, Darren, any thoughts? I didn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I just didn't. Yeah, it was. I didn't. Uh, I, I respected Dolly Parton. Parton. I'm a bit of a fan. I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan. Um, I just, I don't know, something about, I have to have my mind changed. That just to preconceive this, this perception I have of it. I thought, ooh, this could be deadly, uh, this album. And I didn't. I, I didn't actually, I don't think it till just now that we started recording. I don't think I realized that the, the single had been released. Uh, so that's my bad. Uh, that Because I haven't really been paying very, very close attention to it. I've been hearing about it. It's not the first single, I don't think, that's come off the album. And the album's not out yet. Is it the first one? Yeah. Unless that's I've been hearing was... it. It's probably... Well, she had, um... They they had done a preview of a, a Queen track that you yeah, maybe that's oh, we are the champions I think yeah. I'm kind of I'm kind of following it from afar so you know it's my bad that I wasn't aware of that you know, that Let It Be was actually released digitally so I'll do my homework later on and and check it out and I know eventually I will um I will um I don't know if I'll actually get the album but it's it's going to be a double album it's a double album. And that's a lot of a lot of Dolly doing a lot of rock and roll. And I don't I, I don't know. <laughs> Could be fun. I well, mean, I really enjoyed and WFUV embraced her. Uh, she kind of got back to her roots in I don't think it was the 90s. I think it was more maybe the zeros or whatever they call them. She did a series of two or three, I think, bluegrass albums that were really back to her roots not necessarily um driven by trying to get hits i mean it was like she's one of those artists where those days have passed you know getting hit songs like elton mm. john did a bunch of albums like in the 90s into the uh zeros where he was kind of doing it for himself and he wasn't worrying about writing hit singles and there were some of the best albums he had done in a while songs from the west coast and peach tree road um, and Dolly Parton was doing that by going back to her bluegrass roots. I think one album was called The Grass is Blue. That stuff I was really getting into um, from her. Um, so, But this seemed a little, I don't know. I don't want to say the wrong thing. It seemed like a stick in the mud. But you know, I was like, 
cheesy. <laughs> but well, again, I've, I've said that before and have been proved wrong. So I'll I'll listen and if you care, I'll share my thoughts next show. Okay. Well, um, my overall impression is that I like it. I'm not totally blown away by it. Um, I mean you can't not like dolly parton as a person she's one of the nicest people on the planet and you have to have the greatest admiration for her because she's been in the business for so long not only singing but writing her material as well and uh she's just so darn likable <laughs> she does a lot for charity there's no way that she's you dolly. can't like yes and uh you know she sings let it be the way i would expect her to sing let it be it's her voice she still has a great sounding voice, like nothing has changed. But the only thing that's a disappointment for me is that I kind of expected more of Paul. You know, I thought of this as being more of a duet, and I would have been happy if Paul just sang one verse of Let It Be. But instead, you got harmonies, and that's nice. And he's answering back when Dolly sings Let It Be. And I love Ringo's drumming on the track. And anytime there's a, a new cover of a Beatles song or a solo Beatles song, I'm there to listen to it. And if it gets any attention on the country charts or whatever, or it brings people to young fans to discover the Beatles recording, then I'm all for that too. So I'm happy that she did it. And I'm glad that she's making this album. It's kind of like recognition of all of her years in the business. And she wants to work with all these rock stars. Great. So, but I do like the version. I just wish that, like I said, I wish there was more of Paul in it. That's my Is only Paul real... I didn't see any information about that. Dolly said in this quote that he that he plays piano. Okay. So we probably have to wait until the album comes out and look at the, the credits, the musician's credits for that. I have some here. I don't know if it's going to... You see, maybe... You know what it was? And, and, and not to get back, not to beat a dead horse here, but... Um... I'm looking at like the the track listing, the thirty songs on it. I mean, it's mm. already daunting. And then you see that she's covering "Purple Rain" and and uh, "Heart of Glass," "Stairway to Heaven," "Free Bird" closes uh -huh. the album. Um, just kind of, I was just getting the weird, like I don't know, like chills just thinking about some of the. You know, we don't. I, do we need Dolly Parton doing Magic Man and Open Arms? Mm -hmm. That's you know. I, yeah. You say I'm a bad guy here, but I don't mean to be. But that was my reaction to initially hearing. You know, I hate myself for loving you. Night move, <laughs> night move, <laughs> night moves. I could see maybe. Um, I can't get no satisfaction. Why not? You never you never know how any of these releases are going to do. Yeah. And I always look at the cross promotion between the two. Maybe this will draw country fans to some of these rock classics. Dolly Parton you know? cover Oreo Speedwagon. And... Or maybe classic rock fans will discover Dolly through this. Yeah, you that's, know. True. It, that's true. You know. Wow, that's 30 songs. That's that's hmm. that's a lot. That's an hour, over two hours. It's a 140 minute album. Well, this will probably be the only time she ever does this with rock songs. So okay. I'm sorry. I probably pissed some people off. I, I didn't mean to. But... Hey, you got to say how you feel. Better to be honest. Uh, more news and <laughs> trending reporters dot com. I'm sure you follow that website. Trending reporters dot com. They are saying that this collaboration with Dolly Parton is on a relatively new chart created by a Billboard magazine called The Trending Charts, where it sits at number three. This chart is a weekly ranking which tracks the songs that generate the most discussion on Twitter. It's going to be a number one after this show. <laughs> Paul will have a way of making number one on any chart. I get the gold. What do we get? A gold magazine if it gets the number <laughs> I one? I don't know. Speaking of Paul, he just added one more date to the continuation of his Got Back tour, and that is on November 14th in Mexico City. Will he sing Backseat of My Car? I doubt it. You know, he did perform in Mexico City a few years ago, and he just sang that one line. He might do from... Rewind Forward. <laughs> I doubt Sorry. it. 
So this one date in Mexico City, that's actually in between his dates in Australia and Brazil. Hmm. Now, Noise11.com is reporting that George Harrison's solo catalog is being reissued on Dark Horse Records via BMG starting on September the 8th. They are saying the initial release will include five titles on CD and 10 on vinyl. The first edition releases are, and I keep emphasizing first edition because it's probably gonna they're probably gonna add to it. Um, on CD, Living in the Material World, 2006 remaster, Electronic Sound, uh, Dark Horse, 2014 remaster, Extra Texture, 2014 remaster, and the George Harrison album, 2004 remaster. On vinyl, Wonderwall Music, Electronic Sound, Extra Texture. 33 and a third, George Harrison, Somewhere in England, Gontrapo, Cloud Nine, Live in Japan, Brainwashed, Dark Horse, Living in the Material World. Um, those are all the titles coming out on vinyl. Um, the only missing studio album is the classic All Things Must Pass, which was reissued as a box set through EMI Universal in 2021. The 1992 live album, Live in Japan, is included in the BMG reissues. Okay. Um, Concert for Bangladesh, owned by Sony Music, is not. EMI's 1976 compilation, The Best of George Harrison, has not been included, nor have The Best of Dark Horse, 1976 to 1989, and Let It Roll, songs by George Harrison. And early takes volume one. So none of those are included with this list. I gotta I gotta apologize here because you know normally since I have all these records, I don't check online to see if they're still in print. Um usually when I go on Amazon, I see all these these album titles and I figure it's still available. But now they're reissuing it again, which is always a good thing. But it would be nice, you know, I'm hoping that we'll get more remastered albums updated archival box sets for George Harrison's uh catalog. Maybe this is the maybe this is the thing that opens that door. Um I hope they so. do the rest of the albums on C D. Um they haven't said that. They just said this this is the initial release. So to me that means the other ones will probably come out on C D. You know, right. it could open the door or it could close the door. Um once reissues come out of you know remastered albums you, you know you before you bring out an archival set of one of those albums you're gonna have to wait a few years because it would it would seem kind of strange to put out you know just a remastered living in the material world and then six months later or a hmm. year later even a, a a whole box set of of material from those sessions um so it it, it seems to me in a way that the reissues are also a way of saying, you know, we're, you know, don't hold your breath. <laughs> well, you never know. If we're fortunate and George Harrison's solo catalog gets gets the archival box treatment for all of his albums, which I'm hoping for, you know, that's only going to be one year at a time. It's going to be spaced out anyway. Right. So, you know, but it does make sense if you're doing the doing things chronologically you should do the concert for bangladesh next and then material world after that but um i just hope this doesn't slow things down but we'll see um since our last show we have to speak of a major passing that of robbie robertson of course known for years with the band where he wrote classic songs like the weight the night they drove old dixie down and up on cripple creek and for his solo career um, he also worked on numerous uh, TV and film soundtracks, usually with Martin Scorsese. Uh, there are a few Beatle connections. George Harrison has said that his song, All Things Must Pass, was influenced by the band. Members of the band, including Robbie uh, on guitar, uh, played on Ringo Starr's classic album, Ringo, for the George Harrison pen song, Sunshine Life for Me, Sail Away Raymond. The other members being Levon Helm, Rick Danko, and Garth Hudson. Robbie also played on Ringo's follow-up album, Goodnight Vienna. Ringo performed at the band's final concert, The Last Waltz. And when Ringo launched his first ever all-star band in 1989, Levon Helm and Rick Danko were part of the lineup. 
And Ringo appeared drumming on a video with Robbie performing The Wait. This is a few years ago for the charity organization called Playing for Change. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building music and art schools for children around the world. Ringo Starr said, God bless Robbie Robertson. Peace and love to all his family. Peace and love. And you can check out that video on YouTube. That's a great video. It is. It great is. performance overall. With artists from all around the world taking turns at the vocals. Uh -huh. There's a people, um, <clears throat> a couple of like uh, uh, American musicians that I recognize. Marcus King was one. I forget. Lucas Nelson, maybe. Uh, I forget. Gotta play it back again. Uh, but that was really good. Really mm. good. I um, <clears throat> would take this minute just to make a little cheap promotion here. But um, from I interviewed Robbie Robertson in 2011. Mm. Uh, at the time, he was, had just released or was about to release his album, How to Become Clairvoyant. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he came up to WFUV and we did it on a Saturday afternoon. And we had like a small group of WFUV uh, members invited and my mother uh, who was sitting amongst like maybe 20 people. Uh, and it was a really relaxed. Well, I wasn't relaxed, not at the beginning, but it was a relaxed conversation uh, about the, that album, how to become, become clairvoyant. And it is archived uh, on WFUV's website. Now, it may not be that easy to find. So if anybody's having trouble, please feel free to get in touch with me and I'll try to do some of the heavy lifting. If you want to hear the audio of that, uh, that interview from 2011. And, you know, I've always been a massive fan of the band, huge fan of the band. Uh, and uh, Robbie's a hero. So it was, a, it was like one of those things, those, one of those pinch me moments. Uh, you know, you have in your professional career, supposed to be professional, you know, but how many times, you know, you've met or interviewed people that are heroes that like, you know, I, 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 you know like Ralph Brandon, <laughs> I, 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 when I'm in their presence, that was one for me. And then the kicker, eight years later, he came back um, and was promoting what is now his final album, Cinematic. And he came up to FUV in 2019. I someone else did the interview, but when the interview was over, I went in the studio uh, to say hello, and it, it remembered me, mm. like it had been a few months earlier, not eight years. And he remembered that my mother came <laughs> and met my mother. My mother always thought Robbie Robertson was handsome, so that was the, you know, why you know she came and she sat like one of the corner chairs, and afterwards went over and. And it was like a little bit of these one of these moments. Like, wait a minute, my mother was talking to Robbie Robertson. What? How did, <laughs> when did this? How did this happen to me? But um, that was a lot of fun, and you know, going to find Big Pink up in West Saugerties. Okay, I, I, can I can I tell very quick? I'll keep the story brief. A very funny story. My kids were young. We were up in the Woodstock area. My wife, my mother was in the car. The kids. And I'm driving and I got a brainstorm. I'm going to find Big Pink because I don't know when the next time I'm going to be up this way. Um, and did a little research on, on my phone, blah, blah, blah. Okay, finish it. I'm find the dirt, literally a dirt road. Uh, you don't think, I don't know if you've been to Big Pink or have seen it in person. But I have. You have? I mean, it's a dirt road that's getting smaller and smaller. And you keep hearing, you think you hear off in the distance somebody playing you know, dueling banjos. You think you're in a scene out of deliverance. Mm. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. Big <laughs> Pink is on a road like this. You're driving on the moon. It's muddy. Then all of a sudden it opens up and there it is. Like it looks on the back cover of the album, music from Big Pink. Well, I got out to take some pictures out of the car. My kids were convinced someone was going to stick a rifle out one of the windows and shoot me, you know. Uh, so it became a comedy of me trying to get pictures, take in the moment, keep my kids in the car quiet and get out of there before there was a mutiny in the car. Um, uh, but it was like one of those moments like, oh my God, that's big, big. And I, but I couldn't really venture around because the kids were convinced. Yeah. yeah. My wife and I did the same thing looking for a big pink. And when you finally get there, it's this 
normal looking house, not, nothing special. <laughs> you never think that a lot of history was made in the studio. It's just kind of hidden away. And it I, hasn't I mean, been it, used for, for probably a long time, I would think. It's a bed and breakfast. As well, something along the lines of that. Now you can stay mm. there okay. like a bed and breakfast. And they've, uh, the, the, uh, a couple, I think owns the house, or at least they did. Uh, and they've actually kind of restored it to look like it looked in the late sixties for the most part. Mm. I mean, the kitchen, there's a photo of the band hanging out in the kitchen that I've seen. And the kitchen looks exactly like it did even down to the table, which oh, looks wow. like one of those old diner tables you'd see in an old country, like coffee shop. Uh, and the rooms I think are named after what, what band member slept in that room that this was his room uh, i don't think you gain access to the basement though yeah. so um, when when did you go there uh this had to be my kids were little so oh, okay yeah it, i i don't i don't remember when it was and it was kind of spur of the moment you know we were i think we were we were we just went up i we may have been coming from another place making our way back home uh, to New York City, and we stopped, and maybe we're going to eat dinner. And I had the aha moment. <laughs> I don't know when I'm coming back here. I'm going to find Big Pink, and they don't know what I'm talking about in the car. Uh, until the kids were convinced that Daddy was going to get shot down by uh, one of the one of the guys in in the movie Deliverance. Well, you're lucky you got to go inside there because we didn't. No, I didn't get like in the house. So I how did any, you get to see the? Was, the minute I walked to, to five feet from the car, the kids were screaming, "I oh, I come back!" No, I didn't get in. But if you look online, you could find out about uh, okay. staying there, and and all of that's online. I forget what they, the couple. I think they were live in Westchester too, or they did. This was about ten years ago. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry, folks. This isn't the podcast about the band, but. Uh, but yeah, rest in peace, Robbie Robertson. He was, you know, brilliant. And and the one surviving member who's left is the oldest member, Garth Hudson. And a few people have said that word is that Garth's not too doing too well. He's mm -hmm. in well in his 80s. So yeah. can't be far from 90, actually, I think. Okay. All right. Uh, more news here. Ringo posted a photo online from a performance of the Beatles Cirque du Soleil show Love with the message, great news. The Love Show in Vegas just has just won the production award. How great is that? Peace and love to everybody <coughs> in the show. Peace and love. He didn't say what the production award was. He didn't specify. I couldn't find anything online about it, but they won some kind of an award. Kind of hoping it was going to say great news. It's coming to New York. It'd be great if you came to Broadway. Yeah, well, it's it was it's been extended. You know, into next year. That's great news right there. Paul McCartney attended a concert by Ed Sheeran and Emma Gansett at Stevens Talk House on August the 14th. The Star Studded Affair also had Billy Joel, John Bon Jovi, Jerry Seinfeld, Andy Cohen, John Mayer, David Portnoy, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Michael J. Fox in attendance. And Paul continued partying with celebs for Robert De Niro's 80th birthday party at the hotspot Locanda Verde in the Greenwich Hotel in uh, New York City. That was on uh, August the 17th. Also on hand were Martin Scorsese, Christopher Walken, Uma Thurman, George Lucas, Andrew Cuomo, and Francis Ford Coppola. John Halsey. No, there is a name. John Halsey of the Ruddles, who played Barry Wom, is releasing his debut album called Songs of the Donkey Shed. With a new single, Out of Town, there was a new video premiering on August the 12th, and the song was available that day as a digital download and for streaming, and there'll be more to announce soon about that. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for that information. I have heard the new song, Out of Town, very Ruddles-ish. It sounds like something either Neil Innes or Eric Idle could have written. The event called the George Harrison Tribute, formerly Harifest, Harry Fest, will be returning at White's in Westport, Massachusetts for October the 21st. The day is filled with many musicians from the New England area performing George and Beatles music, along with charity events and raffles with proceeds going to benefit cancer research. 
For more information, you can visit the event's Facebook page, which is GHT slash HarryFest. I'm hoping to make it for that as well, October 21st. And finally, um, there's something called Beatles on the Beach Festival, which has been happening for a few years now in, in uh, Delray Beach in Florida. The next one will be happening uh, the last weekend of January 2024. For more information on that, go to BeatlesOnTheBeach.com. All right. The final bit of news concerns a concert that we heard about a few months ago that took place April 4th of 1963. It was at an all-boys school in Stowe, and the Beatles gave a concert there, which lasted about an hour. And um, one of the students there actually recorded the show. And only recently has it even been heard. It is now leaked online. You can even listen to it on YouTube if you look it up. And um, we've all listened to it. And I thought we'd all share our comments about this concert at Stowe. Um, if you want to, I can read out the list of all the songs that were done. And we did this as soon as we found out about this. Um, started with, remember, this is an hour-long show. So they mixed this with a lot of songs that they were doing for BBC Radio and songs they were doing live at the time. So a lot of it is not what they put on their, their uh, EMI catalog. They started with I Saw Her Standing There, then Too Much Monkey Business, Love Me Do, Some Other Guy. They perform Misery live. I Just Don't Understand, A Shot of Rhythm and Blues, Boys, From Me to You, Thank You Girl, Memphis, A Taste of Honey, Twist and Shout, Anna, Please Please Me, Hippie Hippie Shake, I'm Talking About You, Ask Me Why, Till There Was You, uh, Money, and Closing with I Saw Her Standing There. So they open and close with the same song. You left out Matchbox, which comes after Boys. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Ringo sang them both. Yes. And back to back in concert. Back to back. Yeah. yeah. So many unusual things about this concert, you know, but mm. compared to what we know of their concerts from the stuff that had been previously bootlegged, this, yeah. this changes a, a whole lot. Yeah. I, I, and the length right off the bat. What's that? That's the length of the concert. I mean, the, that the school, the students in attendance got them you know, got their money's worth. They got an hour performance at a time. I didn't know they pop bands would play an hour. You know, the Beatles, I don't think, did ever in their concerts. Maybe they did. Maybe. Well, uh, yeah. And and the um, I was reading something about it where the, the tape cuts off. The tape might not have a full. Well, there, money at the there's very rumors end. rumors that there were a couple of more songs perform that were not recorded i don't know if that's true or not if you listen to this concert as it appears online um money is very short it's like it's cut off like they didn't have the full version of it yeah so yeah, I, yeah. and alan might know maybe i think i think they uh i think <clears throat> whoever had the tape had erased part of money for another song not a beatles song uh but later you know, or probably, I mean, knowing that um, having had tapes that people have done this to, it, it could well have been a friend of his who decided to record something on a tape and mm. uh, chose the wrong tape. Uh, but uh, that's, yeah, like also, I've, I've that, um, hmm? that's like recording Star Trek. That's like recording Star Trek over your wedding video or something like that. Mm. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was the wedding video. You recorded over the Beatles. What are you? I um I've uh, heard that uh, the the end of I saw her standing there wasn't on the tape either, and what you hear is an edit from the first version of I saw her standing there. But uh, hmm. I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, you know the fact that they're starting and ending with I saw her standing there. I mean, you don't run into Beatles concert recordings where they start and end with uh you know a song, a repeat of a song. Um, this was just a few weeks after the release of the Please Please Me album, which may be why they started and ended it with, you know, since the opening track on the album. But it also includes 
note to Ringo. It also includes From Me to You and Thank You Girl, which wouldn't be released for another week until April 11th. So not only their new song, but their new song that isn't even out yet. Mm. Good idea, I would say. Huh. Um, let's see what else. Um, also, you know, it's odd, you know, having heard lots of recordings of Beatles sets from 64 through 66, it's odd to have Twist and Shout in the middle of the set. You know, it, it's we've heard it as an opener. We've heard it as a closer. But in the middle, it's odd, you know. Uh, what else? You know what I found to be the most surprising? Mm. Not one George Harrison lead vocal. That's true. Didn't they <laughs> say he was yeah. sick or something? And then maybe it's why Ringo gets two. <laughs> <laughs> Also, you know, all those uh, cuts like um, some other guy, uh, I just don't understand all of these things that we know mainly from the BBC recordings or from Hamburg recordings. Uh, it's 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 really kind of interesting to hear them in the context of sort of an everyday Beatles set, you know, Um but of course they would have been, you know, it's just that we haven't heard sets from that early. Um, the star club is of course earlier by about four months, but we're hearing a lot of those kind of songs in the star club tapes too. And uh, so this is, this sort of catches them, I guess it at a transitional moment before they become the Beatles that everybody knew and everybody who collects bootlegs knows uh you know as a live band uh it's it just sort of extends the story backwards in in, in a really interesting way and it's also a, a i don't know i think it's a a very uh hard driven performance i mean george uh whether he's sick or not he seems to be just going crazy on a lot of stuff mm. because the the vocals are very low in in the mix and it, even i've i have a friend who's uh who, who likes playing with ai to make stereo mixes out of mono things and 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 he worked on this and boosted the vocals like 20 percent, and they're still really low in the yeah. mix mm. um and uh, but because of that, you know, you're hearing more of an instrumental mix. And so you're hearing a lot of the details of George's lead. You don't normally hear because you're focusing on the vocal. I mean, it's yeah. not necessarily that they're not there, but you don't hear it as much in the studio recordings. You know, they're a bit more buried in the mix and uh, and the vocals are, of course, out front. But um, and also in the studio recordings, a lot of the time, not a lot of the time, but some of the time, like for Till There Was You, it's acoustic. And here he's playing electric. And so it's a really different kind of performance. And uh, I, I liked it a lot. I've listened to it a few times and uh, we'll be going back to it, even though, you know, there are people who complain about the sound. It's not much worse than the Hamburg recordings. And uh, the Hamburg recordings are better than are better than a lot of people think they are, because most people have heard the commercial release of the Hamburg recordings where they try to, you know, in the pre AI days and, uh, you know, try to make stereo out of it by doing different EQ on a multi-track tape and then mixing that and then adding in screaming and we're not screaming so much as a lot more audience interaction than there actually is on the tapes um mm. those tapes are out on the bootleg market the the, the pre-messed with tapes and if you haven't found those um look for them because they're definitely worth hearing they sound a lot better than the commercial releases um and a bit better than th than this recording too this recording is out on a bootleg label called empress valley empress valley is uh, I, I know them mostly for led zeppelin bootlegs um i know they do some other things too but they're very respected in the zeppelin world um and i don't know how they got their hands on this but um they did so thankful for it yeah, there's supposed to be this bootleg with two discs on it, and the first one is the the actual concert as it was on the tape, and then with AI on the second disc. Right. 
one thing that well i don't know how how much we all want to learn about ai and its technology but you get the feeling from everything that peter jackson said to us with what he used with mal for uh, for get back that you can isolate everything all the different instrumentation and so part of me is hoping well if you take a recording like this can't you just extract just the lead vocals and play with that and put that on a track and have the lead, uh, lead guitar on one track or the uh, rhythm guitar on one track and the drums on one track if you can do that i don't know because there's different types of software out there but yeah. um uh and also you you have to be aware of the quality of the recording that you're dealing with in the first place, if it's been preserved really well. Um, so, but I'm kind of hoping that with something like this, if they can play around with it and be able to isolate the instrumentation, that's the only way. Cause the only thing that I would complain about here is, is that you don't hear the lead vocals that much. Um, but it is a bit revelatory to hear, like you said, Alan, George Harrison's lead guitar work, especially on the Chuck Berry songs. Um, on Too Much Monkey Business, he's like shredding the guitar on there. And um, I'm talking about you, I think. Um, some interesting guitar stuff from George. And you hear John's rhythm guitar, clear as day, you know, in this recording. And the, the drums are a little bit less in volume than the guitars. But you got to struggle to hear the, the lead vocals. There are some moments there. I'm trying to think. Um song with a lot of harmony in it um you heard it really well oh ask me why you can hear the, mm -hmm. the harmonies very well on mm -hmm. there and um one thing that i found interesting was the performance of love me do because before the they they end the song with the chorus the drumming that ringo's playing is kind of like choppy and it it reminded me more of what pete best was playing on the june 6th recording at emi <laughs> and yeah. you know this is after the records are already out and people know the version that came out on the record so i found that to be a little uh, well different and, and interesting at the same time i was curious about the way it was recorded and i did see a still photo uh online of the uh, the, the beatles on stage and it, it appears that you could see a microphone like dead center that's kind of like propped in front of the stage. Huh. Uh, and it was a, a real to new real to real machine. It was a 15 year old boy, a student who recorded the concert uh, on his new real to real machine. And with the mic, if that was the mic in the picture and placed in a certain way, uh, of course it's going to sound primitive, but I'm surprised the vocals got buried the way they did. I wonder why that was. Hmm. Uh, and it wasn't just like one kind of like, you know, wall of sound of everything, but the vocals got uh, ended up getting buried. But I was listening to it, thinking a lot about those, the Star Club album, the Linga Song Records uh, issued. And I think later on, I found out that it was tinkered with in the studio, like you, like you said, Alan. Um, and listening to this kind of reminded me of the experience of listening to that Star Club record and hoping that you know it probably won't happen that if it only could come out as a historical document as a an album today uh, legally um you I know think it would be cool i think it could because the the ai that um the three of us could play with if we wanted to and my pals play with is um you know is a commercial available AI kind of uh, program that you can get online and, uh, you know, you pay a fee and it will separate things into stems, but it's very limited. The AI that Peter Jackson has is a proprietary system and completely different from these. And, you know, based on what we heard him do with that lunchroom conversation in Get Back, you know, the original recording of that is unlistenable. All, all you hear is silver clattering and noise. You cannot yeah. make out anything anyone's saying. And he got a conversation out of that. If he could do that, I would think that he could bring out the vocals on this. And if he could do that and make a mix, I don't see why Apple shouldn't release it. In fact, if he could do that and make a mix, 
um, and do it instrument by instrument the way he did in the demonstration he did in episode 355, if anyone missed it, um, uh, then they should also be able to put it out in Atmos surround. <laughs> that would be something. Uh. Another thing about this this performance is that, you know, the boys in the school are not screaming, you know, Beatlemania as such hasn't started yet. You know, they're enthusiastic. They applaud. There are some songs where they clap along. Uh, they clearly know Love Me Do pretty well. Yeah. Um, you know, but um, but they're not drowning out the songs. And so you have this incredible performance that you can hear you know, live. And uh, so Apple really should let Peter Jackson take a whack at that and, and see what they can do and, and put it out. That would be nice. Actually, the audience sings along with boys. They do the bop, bop, shoe up. <laughs> you can hear them. <laughs> They're kind of loud, you know, at that point in the song. I also found it really interesting that if you paid attention to in between songs, most of the time it was Paul talking to the crowd. Yeah, right. you didn't hear that much of John talking, you know. So um, you would hear actually it, a couple of times. It seemed as though there was a conversation going on, mm. and I don't know you could because again, because of the quality of the recording, you, it was difficult to hear uh, what who was saying what, or was it somebody in the audience? Was it someone just talking to his friend, and they were right near the microphone, sitting in the front rows? But it mm. seemed actually a couple of times like there might have been a little dialogue between the band and the, the kids in the audience. Right. And I just got having gone to an all boys high school. Uh, I, I can only imagine, you know, there may have been a little fun heckling going on, uh, too, because it did seem very informal. And um, and like you say, the, 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 the crowd, they were zoned in. They were tuned into the performance. They were present yeah. in what the Beatles were doing. Um, so for a historical, I mean, for that alone, I mean, I put it out. Let's start our own record label and we'll, we'll put that. <laughs> well, I'm joking, folks, I don't want to end up in, you know, getting arrested. I, I, I'd Go. love to see this really be worked on with someone like Peter Jackson and his team. Yeah. Um, Peter Jackson you... knows we're making all this work for him. <laughs> All right, so our conversation right there on the concert at Stowe, and that's all the news we have for you this time out. Back okay, to you, thank Alan. You. Thank you. And um, so now we'll go on to your um, your your game show idea. <laughs> game show. <laughs> do, you, it's, do you want to explain the... Um... Yeah, this is something that we do from time to time on the Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast podcast. It's called Rack Our Brains, named after, of course, Rack My Brain, the Ringo Starr song that George Harrison wrote. And basically the whole idea is um, we each come up with a couple of questions that are opinion related questions. This is not trivia of any kind. And my co-hosts here have not been told what the, what the questions are. We each have questions for each other. And it's all just to get an idea of how we would answer these questions off the top of our heads, since we don't know what the questions are going to be. Sometimes it's kind of interesting to to um, observe what a person thinks of first in their in their mind, what immediately comes to mind. And sometimes that could be fascinating to itself. And then at the same time, you might actually regret <laughs> giving the answer that you already gave once you apply some more thought to it. But um, this is just a fun idea to toss around a couple of questions to each other. And whoever who comes up with each question has to answer it himself as well. So we all three of us have two questions all together that we're going to ask each other. And uh, we'll find out, you know, how, how we're responding to each question. Um, like I said, none of us have been briefed. We don't know what we're going to ask each other. But um, this could apply to anything, Beatles, group, or solo. So um, who should we start with? How about me? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm actually going to cheat here because uh, talk more talk. Well, at the Chicago Fest for Beatle fans, they did a Rack Our Brain show. And Kid O'Toole, one of my co-hosts of the show, asked um, the other members of Talk More Talk, who couldn't be there 
in Chicago if we could submit questions. So this was one of the questions that I did submit. And uh, Ken Womack was there and Pierce Hemmingson and Chuck Gunderson. And um, Kit uh, picked one of my questions, which is, what to you is the most fascinating year the Beatles had when they were together? Pick one year and which one would you say is more fascinating to you than all the others? I also have to learn a very valuable lesson that I shouldn't pose any questions that I would struggle with myself. But um, I'm going to ask Alan and Darren that question. And why don't we start with Alan? Um, you know, all of them were great, but I think if I had to choose just one, I would choose 67 because you've got Pepper, you've got Magical Mystery Tour, you've got the film of Magical Mystery Tour and the album. And, uh, you know, even if you don't count it as an album, you have to. You know, uh, it's got strawberry fields on it. It's got, you know, stuff that actually was recorded at the end of 66, but uh, came out as a single, I think the beginning of 67. So it still counts. Um, You've got some of the stuff recorded for Yellow Submarine, even though we wouldn't see it for another year, but those recordings are there. Um, It was just uh, all you need is love. Incredibly rich period. Um, at a time when they were, you know, hitting, you know, well, you could you could argue that they were always in their mature period, but mm. but Pepper is like, and 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 everything around Pepper sort of ushered them into a different kind of area. Um, yeah, I think that would be my choice. Okay, very easy to go with that one. It's mm-hmm. easy to go with most of these years. <laughs> Yeah, you could. Uh, Darren, which one would you pick? Ask the question again. I want to hear how you you word it. What to you is the most fascinating year when the Beatles were together and why? Fascinating year, in my opinion. I thought 67, but for me, it might be beat out by a hair, 1968. Because in 68, the dynamic within the band was getting jostled around a bit. Um, outside forces were beginning to tug a little more. John has met Yoko. Um, George is really now immersing himself in um, Eastern religion, Indian music. The Beatles go to India. Um For many years, we had the impression that, you know, the White Album sessions were difficult and they might have been to some extent. And then we get when the White Album box set comes out, we we find it. We hear a different side that we didn't know existed, a positive, happy side. So the band was still. Was still functioning as a well-oiled machine but wasn't necessarily a well-oiled machine anymore. Um, so there was stuff happening there. And then Apple um, is founded. And Apple played a role, directly or indirectly, in their demise. They weren't businessmen, but spent a period of time during the Apple's early days as like CEOs. And that changed also the dynamic within the four uh, individuals. And you had uh, just, you know, Yoko coming into the picture as heavily as she did. Um, and by year's end, solo albums are beginning to appear. Um, albeit different types of recordings, but even that opening up a whole other uh, um, artistic uh, area with John and Yoko's two virgins and George doing, uh, you know, an album essential, mostly made up of Indian music for a movie soundtrack. It just was such a varied year, 68, that it's fascinating to dissect it and come up with they got along, they weren't getting along, they were breaking up. No, there was still harmony. You know, what mm. went wrong in India? Because you could also get a picture of uh, of disharmony and issues in India, 
yet at the same time, there was a lot of positives that came out of the trip to India. Um, and in the middle of it all, you end up with songs like Hey Jude. Um, you know, coming out of all of that, you say it was probably the year the turmoil started to really infiltrate itself into their world. Um, so to me, that would be my pick. From from a fan's standpoint of dissecting a year and finding a lot of fascinating subplots going on uh, during the course of that year. And then it even, you know, like I mentioned with the emergence of the White Album box set and Giles Martin's claims like, no, these were happy sessions. Mm. These were positive sessions. Okay, that ma that makes the year even more fascinating because there was still positive coming out even though we have heard that that was the year that the cracks started to form. So I picked 68. Boy, you both uh, spoke so well for your years there. And uh, I need a nap what... now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. The more you learn about everything in the Beatles, you realize that you can't look at anything in black and white. Um what Giles Martin had said from listening to the the sessions that there were happy times too. I recall Paul saying in the interview album that came out on CBS in 1980 or 81, um, that was the tense album. You know, Paul said that. <laughs> then there's Ken Scott, the engineer, you know, saying that, uh, you know, they were very enjoyable sessions. They were like any other band, you know, he didn't notice that this was that these were miserable times. It was no different than other bands that he's worked with. So, depending on who you talk to, you get a different story. But they all complete the picture. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. You can pick any one of the years that the Beatles were together and 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 make a case for why that year was fascinating. And um, it's really hard to compete with what you both said with '67 and '68. But these days, I'm just I don't know. I'm very um, influenced by the appreciation the deeper appreciation for revolver as an album and just looking at the fact that they went from rubber soul to revolver which to me there was a sharp contrast there and they really blossomed even more they were constantly blossoming yeah no doubt about it every album showed an evolution and a growth but to me, to jump from Rubber Soul to Revolver was the biggest leap, even bigger to me than, say, Revolver to Sgt. Pepper. But, you know, when you take a look at 67 and you combine Sgt. Pepper with Magical Mystery Tour and all the singles that made up side two of, of uh, Magical Mystery Tour, uh, plus I Am the Walrus, you know, that's an amazing year, too. But you look at how they branched out so much on Revolver um, they were always very eclectic and very diverse musically, but just look at Revolver to do to go from uh, a folk song with a sitar solo like Norwegian Wood to Love You Too, a full blown Indian song, to have a children's song like Yellow Submarine on there, to have Tomorrow Never Knows on there, which was just must have turned a lot of heads when they first heard Tomorrow Never Knows, unlike anything else. How many times have you heard it been said that when the Beatles put out a certain song, it was unlike anything they ever heard before up to that point? Um, you could say Eleanor Rigby was like that, even though the similarity with Yesterday and the String Quartet, and then you have an octet with, with, um, with Eleanor Rigby. But Eleanor Rigby is just, to have a song to have just strings and vocals, and nothing else no guitars no piano no drums nothing i mean that just blows me away <laughs> you know you have george harrison with three really great songs really stepping up the john and paul allowing george to have three songs on the album um so much great stuff the psychedelic music uh, you know i'm only sleeping the great ballads from paul on there amongst his best with here there and everywhere and and for no one, along with Eleanor Rigby, got to get you into my life, having, you know, that R&B sound to it. Um, it's such a marvelous album, but you can always say, well, 
66 they only had the one album <laughs> 67 they had two albums and the white album you got a double album there so you had a lot less in 1966 but the contrast between what they had done prior to that was just so startling that it just blows me away but you know i'll go along with 67 or 68 as well that's that's the great thing about studying this catalog is that there's so much to appreciate about every single release in every year so that was my first question so darren why don't you uh give us your first question all right my question my first question was there ever uh let's say and, and i'll direct it to um to you ken first hmm. uh because that'd be very interesting to see what you will say here and the way i wrote it here uh is, is there was there ever a release single or an album by the beatles or the four individuals I was going to split it into sub groups and say, pick one from the Beatles, pick one. But just in general, one release that made you cringe for whatever reason, not that it was necessarily a bad album or something about a particular release that maybe for you, I'll rephrase it, Ken, a Ken Michaels version of a cringe. The closest that you made you think, I don't know if this one, I don't know if I really like this this much, or what was he thinking, or what were they thinking, or I would have done this better this way, or one release that was not a home run for you, the first one that you think of. Well, to that, I would answer, for the most part, no. There are songs that as songs, I don't look at as strong songs. And there are times when someone like Paul does some off the wall things that I've learned to appreciate later, yes, like that, McCartney yeah, two, that kind of like, like the McCartney two album. Yeah. And even still, that's one of my least favorite McCartney albums, McCartney two. But um, there's never been a time when like the first time I've heard it, I, I've said, you know, this is garbage or uh, no, nothing that strong, unless there is. I know there wouldn't be anything that you would have that strong of a, an opinion about. There are uh, times but, when, I, when I've questioned his choice for what the single is and say, well, I would never release that as a single. Maybe, no. well, you know, well, maybe we'll do. Let me give you my answer to my this question and you'll see okay. what I was. Because the first thing I thought of when I thought this, I was like, Ken tends not to have. uh Tends, tends not to dislike too many, say, albums. We're going to talk about albums. He'll find the good in a lot of the albums, and it'll ultimately win out. So what I was thinking, like, for example, was the way I reacted to two different things. The way I reacted to the 20 Greatest Hits album coming out. That made me cringe when I saw it in the store. Picked it up, and I thought, what is this, something from KTEL? That's what it kind of struck me as, you know, who knew that it was going to be the pre kind of set the stage for one. Mm. And that type of compilation was going to become a hot item. Pack 20 Beatles songs onto one record. I'm thinking all negative. I, mean, I could still remember being in the store uh, thinking, do I want to buy this today? I would have bought probably about three or four copies of it. But back then it was like, you know, do I want to buy this? 20 songs jammed onto one LP. What's the quality going to be like? Um, uh, the cover, they couldn't do a, make a better, make it more eye-catching. The cover was bland. And then seeing that they edited Hey Jude, I was like, no. Uh, another Ooh. thing, and you mentioned McCartney too, was when I first heard McCartney too. I was 15 and I was not ready for it. And I didn't understand it. Uh, so when I heard McCartney too, I thought he lost his mind. And I actually cried after the first time I listened. I remember getting all teary-eyed. Paul, uh -huh. what did you do? What is this? Today, I listen to McCartney 2 completely different. I kind of separated from the rest of his catalog because I can't say I love it in with Band on the Run and stuff, nor do I hate it. Um, but that was my initial reaction. I cringed to McCartney 2 as a 15-year-old fan in 1980. You know, and mm -hmm. seeing so so that's what I was thinking when I said a release that may may have made you ooh, 
All right. Well, you just reminded me of something. Um, I never liked the Beatles movie Medley when it okay. came out on Capitol. I forgot. And, that. you know, at the time, it's funny, I was just getting into working in radio at my college radio station, doing a lot of editing, being proud of my editing, <laughs> and hearing the way that the movie Medley sounded. And I thought that it was very unprofessionally done. And um, it was also, it shouldn't really bother me that much. It was, you know, trying to cash in on the bandwagon of the time of medleys. Yeah. Um, and also, I think after, as, as someone who on the radio, I love doing thematic sets. But after rock and roll music and love songs, then you got real music. Then you got the 20 greatest hits. I think that Capital was running out of ideas of what to do. They tried to find some way to have new Beatles albums out there. And um, I wasn't crazy about real music as a concept, even though I do movie sets on my radio show. But um, no, I, I wish that they could have come up with better ideas, Capital, at the time. Uh, but the movie Medley bothered me to no end. That um, yeah, that's a good, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, the 20 greatest hits, I thought was a clever idea to put all the number ones on there. So for all when when one was the big success, it was worldwide. <laughs> I said, where were all you people when the 20 greatest yeah. hits came out and it didn't chart that high? So I think the public had kind of gotten tired of these concept albums from Capitol at that point. Um, but I would say that. But, you know, um, most of the Beatles solo catalog song wise. I like the songs. There's some few exceptions. There's some songs I don't care for at all. Um, so it's never 100% with me loving everything from the solo Beatles. There are some songs that I don't care for. But for me, I've often said the solo catalog, if you're talking solo, goes from good to great. I don't really consider any of the solo albums to be bad albums. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? okay. All right, Alan. Okay. I'm kind of reluctant to do this one because I have two answers, both of which are albums I reviewed when they came out and didn't like. But fortunately, probably no one will ever be able to find those reviews because this is how I felt about it when they came out and it's not how I feel about it now. Okay. Okay. One of them was Goodnight Vienna. I really didn't like Goodnight Vienna when it came out. I thought, you know, it's trying to be Ringo, but it's not being Ringo. You know, it's just like, it, it just didn't seem as good um, song for song or in any other way. Um, I probably think about that differently now, but I believe in my review, I said it should be melted into an ashtray. <laughs> um <clears throat> Sorry, Ringo. Um, and the other one was John Lennon's rock and roll music. I, I was very disappointed in that when it came out um, because, you know, um, I knew the way John did cover songs as a Beatle. And I really liked those versions. And so I expected him to do something like that as his solo album of 1950s covers and early 60s, maybe. Um, and expected it to be, you know, this is, yeah, John singing this stuff is, you couldn't want better. And, you know, it's, it's just going to be great. And it came out. And I guess what I disliked about it then is what I like about it now, um, which is that, he didn't just do straightforward covers or even covers as close as the Beatles covers were to, you know, the Beatles didn't just do straightforward covers either. They, mm. they, they brought some inventiveness to it. Um, but the inventiveness that John brought to these covers, I just didn't like as much, you know, it just seems very, the songs were very messed with rather than, interpreted um i don't really think that now um i like the album a lot more now 
than I did then. Um, and, you know, and I, and I see what he's doing or was doing. And I think I understand it a bit better and the choices that he made, but um, I, I just didn't really like the arrangements that much at the time. So those are two that I disliked at the time. I'm frantically doing a Google search here on Alan Cozen reviews. Good night, <laughs> Vienna. Nope, they're not going to be there. <laughs> I thought and I asked you And I won't tell you the publications either. Okay. <laughs> it's not in Beatle fan? Nope. Oh, okay. Well, I'll find it. No, you won't. <laughs> so what's your choice? I'll be online. My computer's malfunctioning. Something's happening. Somebody in Maine is... <laughs> <laughs> jamming me over here all right oh, so i guess i have to do uh, my first question no darren darren didn't answer his own question oh that's right no well technically i did that was my answer he did, he, he did too because oh, okay when the questions that's what i thought of i'm like all right cringeworthy could be any way they want to interpret it like my reaction to seeing 20 greatest hits in the store hmm. when it came out i don't know if i knew it was coming out or if you know, showed up one day. This was that was eighties, mid eighties, right? 82. That was eighty two. All right, so probably didn't have much of an advance notice that it was coming out. Actually, then. Real Music and Twenty Greatest Hits came out the same year. They came out the same year. Do they really? I don't remember that. That's a little long ago, though. I didn't like Real Music either because it was like, did, why? It's like a sampler of. Uh -huh. of of these very common things that why well, why do I want an album that combines a hard day's night with with yellow submarine songs just because they were in movies yeah well but I, I did think... buy the movie medley single hmm. all right I mean by that time by the time of real music um I was making videotapes that would have all the songs from Hard Day's Night, all the songs from Help, all the songs from Magical Mystery <laughs> Tour, all the songs from Let It Be. And that just about fills a two hour VHS tape. And I enjoyed watching those. Um, but real music, I thought, well, why don't they why don't they just put out a video of the songs? Why not? Hmm. You know. Okay, okay so um Ken. <clears throat> yes. Uh, <laughs> Of all of the sort of Apple archival things that have come out over the years, so really starting, you know, you know, we're not talking about greatest hits packages or any or real music, anything like that. But of all the archival stuff, is there one that you would have done differently or would remake if you had the opportunity? And what would you do? Well, that's a complicated answer. There's um, with the McCartney box sets, you don't fully know how much unreleased stuff there is. And there are certain uh, McCartney titles and Wings titles where I felt that the um, bonus material was very skimpy. You know, especially, say, Wings at the Speed of Sound, for example. Um, and yet there are box sets like Red Rose Speedway and Flaming Pie and Flowers in the Dirt that I think were done extremely well. Um, but um, if, see, that all depends upon knowing how much there is out there that's unreleased. Right. Um, the two Lennon box sets are fantastic. have no complaints to make about it. I would probably say the Let It Be box set is the most disappointing of all because there's so much material that we've heard uh, of unreleased material and i think they could have given us a lot more i think that's what's sorely lacking on the let it be box set i think when you combine the two discs of unreleased material they could fit on one cd um i also don't like when they've had separate discs for um just the singles at the time for the mono and stereo of each. I don't like how they waste a cd with four songs on there. I would never do that. Um, but basically, I think Let It Be is the one that needs the most work because there's so much really good material out there that I think is, um, you know, worth the fans' while. Um, the people who have heard all the stuff that's been bootlegged, they're not going to mind if it's a 10-CD box set. 
they're not going to care. This is going to be the official release. And if it's improved sound quality, they'll be all for it. Um, you know, I always go for the outtakes and the unreleased stuff before the remixes. There may come a time when remixes may matter more to more to me than they do right now. But I always look for the unreleased stuff first. And I think that Let It Be was uh, really lacking in that department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Darren? Um, <clears throat> I think that they dropped the ball re-releasing Live at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, the original album the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl becoming live at the Hollywood Bowl and change the cover, tie it into a movie and what, add what, one or two, just a couple of bonus tracks songs added on. Great. There was so much more there. And I have been saying all along that what needs to be put together is a Beatles live box set uh, that has um, all of what they have of the Hollywood Bowl performances. The Washington, D.C. concert, their first which we know exists. Um, this Stowe, the Stowe School performance, um, it would be redundant, but the audio from the rooftop um, and make a box set that is a, that is a chronicle of the Beatles live. There's other stuff too, I'm sure, uh, you know, throughout the years and give you a sample of the early stuff. Put some Hamburg stuff out, you know, on, on Apple. Um, and, and give us the Stowe concert, the Washington, D.C. full concert. You could do that on a ma on, on, on a, ma a manageable sized box set because the shows aren't very long. Uh, you know, four or five discs. You, you're going to pack a lot of a lot of material on there and give a rather accurate overview of of the beatles live history and but right now all we have are the two bbc albums which are great i love the bbc albums i think they're essential but that's it yep. you know and live at the hollywood bowl yeah i i don't think i've played live at the hollywood bowl from beginning to end yet really? i haven't had really a desire to i've listened to some of it and I just feel like, ah, you could have given me a little more. There could be a cringeworthy pick for me. You mm. could have, you really dropped the ball on this one. Mm -hmm. Damn it. Okay. So. Mine was essentially the same as yours, mm -hmm. except I didn't really focus on the Hollywood Bowl album so much as the whole eight days a week film project. And the Hollywood Bowl album was kind of part of that and the Shea Stadium film was part of that. Yeah. <clears throat> what I would have done is that, first of all, for the eight days a week film, I've seen some of the stuff that they had access to and didn't use. And to me, that's criminal because there was very little in that film that I hadn't seen before and didn't have in my own collection. And when you advertise, you know, we're going to show you really, you know, deep in the archive stuff. And, you know, I want to see something I haven't seen, you know. Um, and I know that they had access to a lot of stuff. And, it, and what they did was they made a very enjoyable but, you know, mundane film, you know. So I would have redone the film with much more unusual performance material that most people haven't seen um, for starters. Um, but I also would have done what Darren said is released not just the Hollywood Bowl, but a boxed set. And I don't particularly care if it's a reasonable amount of, of discs. What I think they should do is put out, you know, really everything they have of the Beatles live that, uh, you know, isn't just distortion, um, of which there are some recordings, you know. Um, and that means, you know, starting with Hamburg, including the Stow set. Um, uh, let's see. 
there are a few other short things from 63. There's something from the day after Stow. There's a, a two two uh, song set that they played in. I, I think it was for some sort of EMI presentation that also came out within the last year or two mm. um, on bootlegs, of course, not actual real records because they don't do that until everyone already has the bootleg most well that's not fair okay <laughs> um i would include the um the paris show paris 65 shea stadium complete um the two hollywood bowl shows complete um, it doesn't matter if there are flaws, you know, we all understand that there are flaws and you can write about the flaws in the liner notes. Um, these are historical documents at this point and flawedness doesn't matter. Okay. Um, that would mean also at least one of the Japanese 66 shows. There's um, some material available from Germany in 66 um, and then, yeah, maybe the rooftop concert at the end. I I'm thinking more in terms of their public performances, but that would be a nice um, a nice finale. And a lot of this stuff is available on video. Paris, Shea. Uh, okay, Shea's missing two songs, but we've all seen, I think, re recreations of the full Shea Stadium concert where they've taken, you know, material and 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 made visuals for those two songs. Because actually, um, in a couple of cases, some of the things they use in one song in the Shea concert actually comes from one of the two missing songs. So, um, you know, they could fix that up, do it right. Uh, what I'd like to see is an audio and video box set with all of the available live stuff. And, uh, you know, I think they deserve it. I don't think that even, you know, given the flaws, I don't think it would harm their reputation at all. Um, you know, after all, when you're singing um, in a in a situation where you just can't be heard and they didn't have stage monitors, you know, at their feet, the way a modern band does, pumping the mix back to you so you can hear it. Um, I have no idea how they how their performances were as good as they were, you know. Um, but also, you know, there is uh, again, this could all be run past Peter Jackson. He could perhaps lower the level of the screaming somewhat um, and get you know more of the actual performance. So, uh, so that's what I would. That's one Apple archival project that I would completely revamp. Okay. Can I just add something here? Because when you asked this question, I thought you meant something that has already been released and what would you change about it? And that's why I mentioned Let It Be. That's I just did a show, but, but I did a show on my YouTube channel on Ked Michaels Radio, and it's been really popular. Uh, what Beatle fans want released. And several people said exactly what the two of you are saying. Some kind of live release, audio and video. And it's really something that, you know, there's a there's a big hole out there. We just don't have. Yeah. And uh, there's so much stuff that you could even look up on YouTube right now of great performances. You can do uh, TV appearances, too. You can throw in there. You could put Big Night Out in there. There's a lot of great stuff that's out there that should be officially commercially available. And if you can package it in such a way where you have some that are just audio and some that are just video um that's fine you know i think that's a gaping hole right there that's one thing that that um apple has missed the boat on for for so many years is so little stuff i was happy to hear the live stuff that was put in the beatles anthology discs <laughs> you know um uh should capitalize on that no pun intended but yeah. um but yeah I, of stuff that hasn't come out that i would love to see come out you know, although probably I would think Apple's going to be more concerned about that core catalog and making sure every album has an archival box set of some kind. And that's probably a priority, I would think, for them. So yep. there you go. You do both. What's that? You could do both the core catalog and this stuff. 
And look, if a lot of people on your other show are saying it, and Darren and I, which is two thirds of this show, are saying it, and you also agree, yeah. you know, obviously it's time has come, and someone at Apple should be thinking seriously about this, right? So, Definitely, yeah. Ken, question two. Well, I'm only going to pose this question if you give me a different answer, Ellen, because <laughs> you kind of answered what this question, what what I'm uh, about to ask here. Um, and I have a backup question if you don't want to go this route anyway. But my question was, if you could pick one solo Beatles album where over time you appreciate it more now than ever before, which one would you choose? Which would be the biggest transformation for you? Not that it's an album that you hated when it first came out. Maybe you just liked it a little bit and now you think it's really strong, mm -hmm. you know. We all know that over time, our opinions can change on things. So right. what I would like to know is between the two of you, what solo album would you pick where initially we didn't think much of it and now you really like it a lot? Okay. So um, I'll start with you, Alan. I mean, you mentioned rock and roll. So other than rock and roll. Right. So other than rock and roll and Goodnight Vienna. Mm. Um, okay. I could still do too. <laughs> um, but let's say, let's say Ram. I liked Ram okay when it came out, but I never really understood why there were a lot of people out there who really thought of it as his best record. I mean, you hear that uh, for, for the people who feel that, they feel that even more than Band on the Run, I guess, you mm. know, in the same way as there's, you know, Pepper versus Revolver, you know. Um, I thought Ram was OK. I didn't really think that much about it. I played it a few times when it came out. I played it over the years, uh, you know, sporadically. Didn't really didn't really make my, you know, top 20 list of you know, solo Beatles records necessarily. I mean, not that I actually had one, but um, <clears throat> I don't think it would have been on it. But, you know, working on the book, writing about how Ram was put together and listening much more closely than I ever had listened to before. And two, um, you know, also outtakes and things, you know, being built up and, and how Ram was put together and, and all of that uh, just completely changed my mind about Ram. I now think of Ram as, as really one of his best things. I'm not sure I'd say better than Band on the Run or Flowers in the Dirt, but it's up there. I mean, those would probably be my top three McCartney albums, hmm. um, which Ram wouldn't necessarily have been in in the past. But now it's, um, you know, I, I don't... I don't understand how I could not have seen what was going on in backseat of my car all those years until we started working on the book. Hmm. So um, there you go, Ram. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, if you ever want to have a deeper appreciation of an artist's catalog, write a book. That's it. <laughs> in, in detail about every song and every unreleased song. <laughs> study everything that's ever been done by that artist and you'll have a deeper appreciation because my second choice would have been wildlife you know i really disliked wildlife and I, it's i still don't think of it as as good as ram or as good as most of his things but again writing about how it came together what went into it um how paul perceived it you know, as mm. side one versus as a dance record, you know, the ballads on side two, the rockers on side one. I, um, I, I've come to have a, a greater appreciation of it than I did when it came, when it was out. And for all the years between when it came out and when we worked on the book. Mm. And that was uh, one of the things we wanted, you know, for, for readers, you know, to come out with a greater appreciation for things that they might have shrugged off in the past. Mm -hmm. and hopefully you've done that with volume so, one mm -hmm. and with the subsequent volumes to come um darren well the first one i think of is the self-titled george harrison album 
when I came out in 79, I had it, bought it pretty close to release. Um, I think it was bought for me. A friend of mine got it for me for, as a birthday gift, I think. And I always enjoyed it, always liked it. No, it was not, uh, never, a, it was never a doubt. But I, I didn't, I didn't realize early on what a special album it was. And, um, to me, that's holds it holds its own amongst George's best, which to me is Old Things Must Pass, 33 and the Third, Living in the Material World. To me, it is right, if not in with those three, then right underneath, right, right in there. Um, I, I didn't feel that way about it when it first came out. It took a long time for like the light bulb to suddenly go off and realize, wow. I think I liked it upon release. I think I liked somewhere in England better than George Harrison. But as years went by, I was like, no, no, George Harrison's got something special happening in there, you know. And and then I later learned, you know, he's married now and uh, had, was a father, had become a father, married again, had become a father, and uh, this the domestability. <laughs> the domestic bliss comes through huh. uh, on that album. Um, none of this occurred to me back in the day. Um, so George Harrison is the first album that comes to mind. The second one would be Red Rose Speedway, which was my first McCartney album and was always an album I loved, but never thought much of When the Night and, uh, and, and Loop. Uh, yet, in recent years, I thought, you know what? Damn it, 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 it really impacts me as much as any album he's done. And I know it's not as good as Band on the Run or Ram, or, but you know what? Uh, it's not far off. So that would be my second choice in this, in this category. Always liked both albums, but they grew in stature for me. Um, hmm. So... Those would be the two I'd go with. All right. You know, I, I think living in the material world, I could also, I don't want to drag it on and say living in the material world, living in the material world sounded when I first got my hands on a copy, it sounded important. It sounded grand. I can't honestly say that every track on that album appealed to me at the beginning, but it too, like George Harrison, as I got older and as time went by, I was like, this is actually a fairly brilliant album. Hmm. So, and it just seemed like the, 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 the skeptics were just not getting able to get through the, the, you know, the preachiness of it. No, go past that. Cause this is, this would have been a hell of a Beatles album. Hmm. Hmm. So, okay. Those Some are really, two. yeah. Really good choices there. Excellent. Um, this was not an easy question for me because every solo Beatles album of music, I specify that, you know, as opposed <laughs> yeah. to as Why? opposed to two virgins or you know, something like that. Um, I've always said, you know, solo albums go from good to great. I've never felt any solo album was a bad album, even initially. But when Driving Rain came out, I liked a lot of it. There's some things that I didn't really gravitate towards. But um, I love the album now. I think it's oh. a, a Driving Rain. You love Rain. the album now. Well, I didn't understand what you said. Yeah. I, I <clears throat> consider it a near great album. There's so much variety on there. And I appreciate variety when it comes to certain artists, <laughs> especially McCartney, where he is so eclectic musically, um, just like the Beatles were as a band. And um, I love all the the mixture of all the different styles to have Lonely Road, which is a, you know, a great lead off track. Yeah. Um, and really worked well as a live song when he toured with it. And um, other rockers on there, like About You, which has this really fat sound to it. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, to do something as crazy as Rinse the Raindrops and have this you know, long jam that goes on for over 10 minutes. I like when Paul does wacky things like that and does experimental things 
you know, there's a little bit this there's similarities between driving rain and press to play for me. There's there's traditional Paul and there's experimental Paul. And traditional on driving rain, you've got something like um I do, which is a really nice ballad on there, or your way, which has a folk country feel to it, could have fit on um maybe Ram, like another heart of the country type song. And then you've got the experimental stuff like uh, She's Given Up Talking or um, Spinning on an Axis, which I love a lot. I know I've said several times here, I love how he plays with his vocals on that song and goes for some high notes at certain points. Um, it sounds very spontaneous, that particular song. I like the looseness of it. And yet, um, you know, it's got a little bit of everything on there on that album, riding into Jaipur with that, you know, Indian sound to it. Um, so much good stuff. I love the song Heather. Um, I love the uniqueness yeah. of yeah. that song, which could work kind of like a soundtrack movie song to me. The fact that it goes on for like a minute or more without any vocals, and then you have one verse and that's it. <laughs> and then the song ends. Um, I love that, uh, the way that song was presented, that format of the song. Um, from a lover to a friend, that that hook in there in the middle chorus, you know, once that song's in your head, it's stuck there. Um, you know, a lot of great stuff scattered all throughout that album. And um, I know some people have said the album suffers because there may be too much music on there. And I can understand that. Um, but to also tack on Freedom at the very end was a nice bonus track. Um, so, you know, I love everything about Driving Rain. Um, and the title track, which we've talked about here on the show, and I don't make fun of the lyrics of one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive because it's very similar to one, two, three, four. Can I have a little more? Um, you know, and I, I love the melody of driving rain and how it ends the way it does. It's kind of suspended, um, with the chords that are played at the end, very unusual ending for that song. I like unusual endings, but, um, yeah, I mean, I thought the the album was good when it first came out, and now I would say it's it's close to great. It's really grown on me a lot. So that would be my choice, right there. Okay. okay. So, Darren, question two. Yeah. So my second question, uh, my second question goes with album packaging. Now, I initially planned. I initially was thinking in terms of. Not to make this more complicated, leave box sets out. But if you want, if you want to go to box sets or reissues, and mention um, what are what is your favorite package album package? Like for example, <clears throat> if I can reverse that, what was a letdown to me? Abbey Road was a letdown, my favorite album of all time, because after the White Album gave you, and then you'll see how I'm thinking. After the White Album gave you posters and the 8 by 10s and 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 that coming after Sgt. Pepper, so elaborate, and the inner sleeve and the cutouts and whatnot, uh, Abbey Road had nothing. Uh, it was, you know, it wasn't even a gatefold. It was like, really? Um, so I'm thinking in terms of that when I say packaging, something that you really thought looked great and you got the album at home and oh wow it comes with a poster and uh you know or stickers or you really like the way they did the design on the label to mirror what was on the album cover what was an album package or throw out a couple if you can't narrow it down to one that knocked you out now alan's kind of relaxed which either tells me he's got one right at the tip of his tongue. It's kind of <laughs> very like, oh my God. So, Alan, I'll ask you this for, or should I answer it first? Why don't you do it? Uh, okay, I'll answer it first. And the one that, um, the one that, and I'll give a couple because it's hard to get just one. This is a kind of like, a, but living in the material world, I always thought it was gorgeous package i love the album cover i think it's an iconic cover 
Um, I I I kind of this is going to sound wacky, but it's just nothing like looking, nothing like looking at the, living in the material world and the the dark side of the moon side by side. I don't know why that just knocks me out, but I love. And uh, the whole thing is beautiful, the package of, of living in the material world. And I always enjoy George's, uh, you know, the way that the albums were presented. It was a little bit of a letdown when he ended up at Warner Brothers because they kind of got ordinary. Um, they'd lost that certain something. Um, so, you know, living in the material world. Uh, another one that I would pick in this category is Venus and Mars. Venus and Mars, you get a poster, you get stickers. I l really like the 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 um, cube, like the the pool balls or planets on the cover, the red and the yellow, and the way they, you know, that's a hypnosis cover. I think. Um, I don't know if if, if Storm Thorgerson was involved in it, but Audrey Powell was, and just the use of the balls as. Uh, I always got a kick out of the liner notes of that. I got them 10 years old when the album comes out. And if you read the liner notes, uh, the poster with uh, one of the posters is referred to as a balls poster. And I went, <laughs> they have a poster of balls. Uh, but I just like the way that the imagery with the red and uh, yellow ball uh, balls. I'm going to laugh my way through this. But you know what I'm getting at. So those would be two of the ones I would think of. Um, I never really liked the cover of, of, of Imagine. To me, Imagine seemed like, or well, mind games, they seemed a little slapdash to me. Those mm -hmm. covers, you know. So that's where my head was at Was like when I came up with the question. Okay, so we're Applin. About, we're talking about solo covers. I, I could, uh, no, you could anything you want it to be. Because if something really jumps out at you that's a Beatle cover, that would blow, that, then let's go with that. Or um, and full packaging. I mean, down to the whole thing. Gee, I like the way the spine looks on the shelf, Darren. That's fine. Anything that really uh, appealed to you and hooked, hooked you. Okay. Grabbed I mean, you. I would, I would have to go. Well, it's hard, you know. I mean, Pepper did. You you couldn't you couldn't look away. You know, look at that cover. You know, you're you're spending a lot of time figuring out who all those, all those people are, and then inside you have the portrait of them in their uniforms. You know, sitting. Uh, you know, as they are on the front cover, but a more sort of casual, you know, thing of just the four of them. Um, the back with all of the lyrics. Uh, I, none of their records had that before. Um, and it was great being able to read what they were actually s singing. Uh, wish they had the chords too. <laughs> That could have been an insert. And then there was an insert with the, you know, mustache and picture of Sergeant Pepper and uh, the drum stuff that you were supposed to cut out and, you know, do things with. But no, no one really did that, you know, except you did. apparently Mark Lewison did because um, in, in Philip Norman shout, um, he talks about Mark as like a, you know, six year old or whatever he was uh, dancing around his backyard with the Sergeant Pepper mustache on. <laughs> so he must have cut them out, but I sure didn't, you know, to me, that would have been ruining one of the elements of the album. So, so I guess Sergeant Pepper, <laughs> excuse me, Sergeant Pepper was the first that came to mind. Um, I'll leave it at that because. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, that's fine. And I'm dying to see what's going to come out of Ken's mouth by the pained look on his face. <laughs> well, you know, I think without you realizing it, you do spend a lot of time on the packaging, but it's not something that has always been so essential to me when it comes to the music, which always comes first, you know, and I, and I understand, I definitely understand the days of vinyl when you had so much more to look at, how appreciative I was and a lot of people 
have been when lyrics are printed in the packaging. I would definitely go with Sergeant Pepper on that level for and for everything um, that Alan said. Um, and for that matter, you know, Magical Mystery Tour to have that booklet in there with all the photos taken from the yeah. film and all that. That was a nice bonus <laughs> to have to go with the album. Um, but it's it's not really something that I spend that much time looking at. I loved the fact that in the days of Apple, the labels, the A and the B sides wouldn't necessarily be Apple's, although sometimes they were. And like on Living in the Material World, you have the the photo of the um what would you call it the the um the driver and the limo yes. on one yeah. side i like how clever yeah. that is what they did with that like on wildlife you know to have paul on one side and linda on the other on the on the labels themselves yeah. mm -hmm. i love when they did and they played around with stuff like that um i like the packaging of all things must pass the different color of the inner sleeves with the lyrics on it Although the Apple label, you know, what they were apples. Um, it was also cool to see the inside of the Apple cut, <laughs> you know, yeah. on one side. I loved all that. And you had the poster that went with All Things Must Pass. Those are ones that I would that I would pick out. Venus and Mars, like you said, had a lot of uh goodies to go along with it. But, you know, um, I don't me. tend to think about it too much, but those are ones that stand out for me. See, I, wish I, I had a better answer, though. No, mm. I was always, but I was always a, from being a little kid. And I think that played a little bit of a role in me being a record collector today. Maybe more of them, just a little bit of a role in me being a record collector and maybe my general love of music. Uh, I was always mesmerized by record labels and and uh, album covers, uh, I could, you know, I could describe almost every one of the label designs of the 45s that I had when I was a kid. Mm. Non-Beatles, Frida Payne's Band of Gold, Invictus Records, Blue Label, Thinking Man, that was the logo. Uh, you know, I remember this stuff. T-Sets, My Bell and Me was on Colossus Records, Yellow Label. I mean, I remember all of this stuff. And when it came to, you know, especially with Wings in the 70s, I loved, I was like, oh, what am I going to get? Because Wings always had, the, there was always something elaborate in there. And um, Venus and Mars, I remember when I realized that I got chipped because my record didn't come with the poster. I got the stickers. I didn't get the poster. And that's why I didn't know what Ball's poster meant, who designed it in the liner notes, because I didn't get I thought they meant the little round sticker that had the cover. Uh, I loved all that stuff growing up. Mm. You know, getting the poster in London Town, getting the poster in Wings Greatest, um, um, and feeling, you know, a little chipped when there wasn't something. Come on. And custom labels, like you pointed out. So that's why, you know, to me, I thought an album packaging question, we'll see what happens. I'll throw that out there. Because that was always. But if you think about Abbey Road in the middle of all of this, mm. Abbey Road, there's nothing going on. At least we'll let it be. The U.S. got a gatefold. The British got the box set, the limited edition box set. Abbey, Abbey Road, nothing. I feel like uh, Bobby Fleckman, Final Tap. You know, the there was nothing the in cover. that. The, the girl in the back cover has, has a nice leg. No, uh, <laughs> you know I'm looking for. You know, well, I was I'm a kid. I want posters and stuff. Okay, might but, be, uh, it might be a good idea at some point we discuss just the album covers. Yeah, because well, we I, all have favorites of those. I, I, yeah, the Beatle album covers. I well, most of them. If we ever did this as a show, most of them I think are disappointing. Like I think this. Like what's going? They couldn't come up with any more exciting something exciting to help. You know what I mean? Uh, who approved the picture for the cover of Beatles for Sale? It's a great picture, but for yeah. an album cover? I'm so used to it. To me, they're all I don't, iconic. The, you know? why I, I, the title of Please Please Me as an album really bothers me. Please Please Me. What kind of name is that for an album? I know there's a song on there called Please Please Me. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little wacky now. <laughs> We've been going how many hours now on this show? <laughs> yeah, this I'm is... beginning to lose it a little bit. Maybe you think too much. That's I should Paul just, Simon that's Paul said. Simon song. Yeah. I should just point out as a, you know, a commercial announcement, so to speak, that in the McCartney legacy books, we really are focusing also very closely on the creation of the album covers. I mean, it's part of the, for us, it's part of the creation of the yeah. album and clearly for Paul, it was part of the creation of the album because um, all of these ideas, you know, he, he seems to have been the only hypnosis client who was able to get them to do his ideas. You know, they mainly oh, wow. do their own ideas. And that's why um, Storm uh, basically cut out after Band on the Run um, because uh, he didn't, he, he, from his point of view, the firm was to come up with ideas and execute them not be told ideas and execute them. Um, but our repel was okay with it. And, uh, oh, and so, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but um, in the course of doing this for each of these albums, um, you know, cause we also, we also talk about, you know, what the written material on the album say, who gets credit, who doesn't get credit, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of interesting to us. Um, hmm. But we, noticed in you know while while writing this up you know i would always get the british and american covers and make sure you know because sometimes the label copy was different and i wanted to get into that and just never had noticed it before but discovered while writing the band on the run chapter that the back cover of the british and american albums are different shots mm. you know there's the you know, one has a coffee stain, one doesn't, you know, and 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 the 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 things on the back cover are in different places, slightly different places, and not so much that you would even notice, you know. Also, I think the order in which Paul, Linda, and Denny appear on the two labels is different, UK versus US, so. You pointed to that out, and I've been meaning to go and see if I could get a UK copy of uh, on eBay, and I always forget to do that. But you didn't. Um, if you notice that the spine of Band on the Run just mentions Paul McCartney, does not say Wings. Right. I think you pointed that out once, and yeah. I hadn't noticed that, uh, but missed that while writing the book. But um... it bugs me when I see the spine. That's the OCD, though. <laughs> yeah. I see. The find a band on the run it just says paul mccartney why does it say wings mm. the spine of see this is how this stuff may imprints on me the spine of wings the speed of sound says wings right speed of sound what happened after well, you're out of the letters in the printing press <laughs> you know i i'm not I, sure if I, I asked you this uh, alan I could have asked you this a while ago, but since you're on this subject, I don't think it was really covered in the McCartney legacy, but why is it that George Martin's contributions to stuff on Ram, like the, you know, the, the scoring and the arrangement on Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey and Backseat of My Car and Long Haired Lady, and as we were to learn later on, um, Little Lamb Dragonfly, which is from that period anyway, why didn't George Martin get any credit on the McCartney albums? He's in the he's in the actual sheet music, right? For Ram, I think. I'm not sure about that. I have, uh, we'd have to double check on that, but yeah, but I don't know. Um, Paul, he was he was very inconsistent about who he credited and who he didn't. Maybe he just doesn't really think that much about arrangers because he doesn't credit Tony Visconti. Mm. on uh for the arrangements and conducting on band on the run you know it may say thanks tony or something like that but it, it's that's not a professional credit you know as someone like that would want on an yeah. album all right i think i still have a second question oh okay I wrote down a, a bunch of questions that um they're all sort of long and complicated but maybe we can come up with short answers to this one um okay for each of the solo Beatles, what would you like to see released? And I'm thinking archivally, but not necessarily. Who should start? <laughs> okay. So 
For Paul, well, most immediately, I really would like to see the last two Wings albums get their archival <laughs> treatments, but I'd like to see them get, as as Ken mentioned, some of his archival treatments are not so thorough and some of them are quite good. I'd like to see them be quite good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, apart from he should he should you know work ahead through the rest of his albums they should all have archival sets they should all be um as much outtakes as possible and then he should go back and redo a couple i think we want to have that cassette of demos that he had done up in scotland before going to record ram i th and we've heard nothing from that you know i'd like to hear the whole thing um really would like to hear outtakes of every song that he hasn't released, you know, on the album where they go. I'd also like to see the demo of Band on the Run. Um, mm. Still exists so far as we know, the four tracks that were done up in Scotland before he copied them to the set and brought cassettes to Lagos where they were stolen. But the master is around want to hear it um so that's basically um it for paul uh you know just archival sets for everything with as much as possible in them and redoing at least those two to include those two items and uh you know there are probably things that could go on each of the ones he's done so far but um george They've done very little, you know, they've given us an archival set of all things must pass, but we need archival sets of all the rest of them far more than we need reissues of just the standard albums. If you do archival sets of all the albums with lots of, um, you know, on the way to the finished version recordings and any song outtakes there are, things like that, then you wouldn't have to bother with things like take one, you know. Um, you could put take one of everything in each archival set, and that would sort of obviate the need for a separate take one disc, you know, or first takes, whatever. Um so that that would be George. You know, George, a lot of work to do. Same with Ringo, a lot of work to do. With Ringo, we haven't had any archival albums. Not sure how much extra stuff there is, but we know that there is extra material. I mean, we know that there's the Chips Moment album, which he, you know, disavowed and um, and didn't like. But I bet there is salvageable stuff there. I mean, we've heard some tracks from it. And I bet there is some salvageable stuff that he could include in an overall archival set of, you know, Ringo outtakes or something, you know. Um, although I'd, I'd still like to see each album get a separate treatment. So John, okay, so Yoko has been doing really the best work of any of the uh solo Beatles or estates in putting out unreleased John stuff and even released John stuff. I mean, she's worked on his catalog every which way. I mean, she did remixes. The remixes were sort of criticized. Some people liked them, some people didn't like them. Then when she put out uh, that big Lennon box, she used the original mixes in remastered versions. So we've got remixes, original mixes. And then for the first couple of albums, we've got great archival sets, but that's as far as it goes. And I'd like to see great archival sets for everything up through Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey, which really should just be one archival set of those sessions. So that's what that's at least part of what I'd like to see. I mean, you know, my plans would include huge video components and things too, but I'll leave it to the team. Boy, we just got through talking about this on my channel. It's all about what we want released. Uh, um, you know, a lot of what you said, Alan, is exactly how I feel. I've enjoyed all the McCartney archival box sets that have come out, but like I said, some of them with bonus material have been kind of chintzy. The um, template you should follow is what Yoko and Sean 
have been doing with the two Lenin box sets with Plastic Ono Band and Imagine. I like hearing all these different versions of each song, take one, evolutionary mixes, unreleased stuff. They really packed it with so much stuff that I really think nobody can possibly complain about those two box sets from the Lennon camp. And I wish that, you know, some of the stuff that, that Paul has done, like Flaming Pie, Flowers in the Dirt, Red Rose Speedway, um, there's been a lot of great bonus material there. But... And a lot depends upon how much really exists, how many outtakes of every single song. You're going to go through the best outtake of each song. Is there really an evolution in each song to explain how every song became what it was? Um, it's a lot more work to put into that stuff. I wouldn't mind if some of those box sets were redone. You know, it, this year is the 50th anniversary of Band on the Run. Have a have an all new one. And like you said, Alan, since we do know those demos exist for Band on the Run before Henry and Denny Sidewell left, let's hear it. Be fascinating to compare what it, what it sounded like then to the finished product. And, uh, you know, Denny Sidewell has said that Paul copied a lot of what he came up with for drum parts on Band on the Run. But... I want every single album of his to come out as an archival box set up through all the newest stuff through McCartney three. Um, I did say the one thing that I want most of all is it's a wonderful life because not one single word is being mentioned about that project. Now, when it was first announced, it got a big splash in the media. And um, if it's not going to come out, tell us. I don't understand what the delay has been in this. We had COVID and then once uh, things improved and Broadway opened up and it was originally going to open in London, I heard nothing happened. Paul doesn't say one peep about It's a Wonderful Life and he's written all the music for it. And I believe that it's been recorded. I believe that there's a soundtrack album that's already been done. Not with Paul's vocals on it, although I'm sure there are demos for that. But, you know, you've got that. You've got High in the Clouds, the animated film that he's been working on for many years now. That's uh, the music for that's already been done. We do know that's going to come out probably in a few years because these animated films take a long time to finish. Um, and then there's also the question of, even with all these archival box sets coming out, does that mean everything that's unreleased has to be in those box sets? What about the whole idea of cold cuts? A lot of what was in Cold Cuts has ended up in these archival box sets. But maybe there's a lot of interesting stuff that maybe won't fit these archival box sets and put out something, you know, some kind of McCartney rarities there. Um, you know, it's endless what you can do with Paul with that massive catalog that he's got. Um, Lennon, every single album of his that remains there should be an archival box set. I wouldn't mind a Double Fantasy Milk and Honey combined one. Um, and if they're done the same way as Plastic Ono Band and Imagine, that would be fantastic. We still don't know. No one has said why sometime in New York City wasn't released. We're all guessing that it has the least amount of commercial appeal. You know, it was too political an album. Question about the N-word on the first song. You know, there's all these things that come up and we've never been told. No one's been straight with us why it hasn't come out. Um, but I would like all those albums to be given the same kind of treatment that Plastic Ono Band and Imagine have gotten. Um, I like the job that was done on All Things Must Pass. I'd like to see all of George's catalog be handled that way. Definitely do something on the 1974 tour, some kind of um, concert film slash documentary. Um I've said a number of times that there was a press release that came out shortly before COVID hit. I think it was in Rolling Stone and Olivia and Danny were quoted in there about what their plans were as far as George's catalog. And it went through Dark Horse, didn't say anything about extra texture, it was only through 1974 and it included work on the, the 74 tour. So you know that it's been discussed and I'd like to see that handled, the live in uh japan tour i'd like to see some kind of concert on that um 
and maybe kind of like I was saying with McCartney having some kind of rarities box set um, that may not fit the archival box set, something like early takes, volume, whatever, <laughs> you know, will that all end up in archival box sets? We don't know. I just hope that there are more archival box sets to come out. Um, I like to always mention that George Harrison said in Billboard magazine in an interview he did with Timothy White, I've got more unreleased songs than Jim Reeves. <laughs> okay, let's hear them. <laughs> so will they end up on box sets, these archival box sets? Will they ever come out? We have to wait and see. And Giles Martin did say shortly after early takes that he was working on another volume of early takes. But that could have all been sidelined by All Things Must Pass and maybe box sets for each album. Okay, and same thing with Ringo. We don't really know how much unreleased stuff there is with Ringo and how many outtakes there are of every single <clears> song <throat> and how many unreleased songs there are of every song. I do recall that uh, Eight Arms to Hold You, Chip Maniger and Mark Easter's book said that there was some unreleased songs from Ringo's Rotogravure. How much exists of outtakes, if anything, from Sentimental Journey? I don't know. <laughs> we know that um, Autumn Leaves was recorded during those sessions. It's been bootlegged. How much is there outtakes of Bukuza Blues? And then from Ringo on, there's a bootleg I have from the Ringo sessions, which isn't all that interesting. It's kind of like different mixes of songs from the Ringo album. Right. I don't know how much that would be appealing even to a diehard Beatle fan, but I'd love to hear outtakes of some of those songs if they exist so if there are for all the albums i'd love for there to be archival box sets for every single one and i know that some people are going to say there's no demand out there for ringo you can at least do the ringo album you know if you're going to do any at all you have to do it for that one and um even for albums for which there's less of a demand make less copies <laughs> so it doesn't cost so much for the record company to do that um because of who these people are they're a part of history and the beatles were the most important most successful band of all time because of their stature i think everything should be given special treatment every single album regardless of how much it sold initially you know um those are my general feelings there and um yeah, maybe have uh, an updated <laughs> video compilation of some kind of Ringo's. Um, that would be nice. There needs to be updated uh, remastered videos for each of the solo Beatles stuff, I think. That's true. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think that covered everything that I could think of. Okay. Did Darren. I leave anything for you, Darren? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, for me, it's easy. Uh, Ringo off right off the bat. I understand the demand. I understand is there interest, like you've mentioned, you feel there is. I'm not sure there is. There is for me for an archival box set of Bad Boy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, but I think if nothing else, Ringo just deserves to have his catalog reassessed. And I would like to see if nothing else, an Apple box set with remasters of the Apple albums. Mm -hmm. That would make me very happy because it'd be a nice way to showcase uh, those Apple albums. Uh, they've never were remastered. I always thought the discs sounded pretty good, but what's out there now. But remaster them, enhance the packaging a bit on the CDs and the LPs. Add, if you, here's an opportunity if there's not a lot of extra material. Here's where you add a bunch of really cool bonus tracks and improve on what's out there now. I understand that the rest might be hard because I don't know who owns Masters to things that were on Atlantic or on, what was it, the Atlantic albums, I think, were on Polydor in England. Right. And you had, you know, uh, Stop and Smell the Roses. Who, was Boardwalk. Was yeah, that was BMG maybe now, unless, I mean, Capital was involved in the reissues, the Right Stuff label that reissued in the CDs in the 90s of Stop and Smell the Roses and right. Old Way. Right. That was Capital. 
to how does Rhino get involved here? Because Rhino was able to put out Starstruck. There's a lot of labels that may be the hindrance, though, to maybe a career span, something career spanning. Um, how to get your hands on all of those masters? Doesn't seem like Ringo's that interested in stuff like this. The fact that there isn't going to be any sort of reissue of the Ringo album and the way he adamantly said no. You know what I mean? It doesn't seem like Ringo really in that press conference. You well, know, when he asked about. He said, are you doing anything special for the Ringo album? I don't know if that meant, are you celebrating on the anniversary or anything like yeah, that? Necessarily, yeah. is there going to be a box set? He doesn't seem to strike me as someone that feels that that's important. Hmm. Well, that's sad because um, this is his legacy. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I definitely could be wrong. I don't, I've never asked. But so for Ringo, I'd start simple. Did nothing else give me a nice Apple box set of the of, of those albums. And, you know, if anything else could be conjured up, I think there would definitely be an audience for a collection that gathered as as um, kind of controversial as some of the albums could be, who thinks they're awful, who likes Rigo the Fourth, who doesn't. You know, there still, I think, would be some sort of market for a package bringing all of that stuff together. I mean, he's made 20, 20, 20 studios. Yes. yes. Plus the EPs. Lennon, i got to be honest with you, I'm going to be an ogre here. I don't need anything more from the archives. I think it's been a little beat to death. Mm -hmm. You know, one compilation album comes out, one best of album, three years later is another best of album, they're remixed. The new best of album brings you back to the original mixes. Um, the you albums that if you, you want expanded box sets, whatever went wrong with some time in New York City, maybe you still see it. I was hoping that maybe there was maybe some sort of legal issue, so they'll put it aside and move on, but we've heard nothing about a mind games set. You know, I think I think you could combine mind games and walls and bridges. I kind of listened to those two albums together, Double Fantasy, Milk and Honey. Um, they may still come. It I wouldn't shock me if those still happen. But I'm all right right now with the with the way Lennon's catalog has been reissued. George needs a career best of album. Mm -hmm. He needs, if nothing else, a detail. And we did a show on this. Right. Greatest hits album of his entire career. Okay, because that's that hasn't existed. Um, I, I, and I, and I think eventually there will be some. My gut is there will eventually be some sort of archival box set series. I, I don't know if every album is going to get treated. Maybe there's several albums that'll be coupled together in an era, you know, the Dark Horse era box mm. set. Uh, but simple Ringo overhaul the Apple albums. Um, John, I'm all right for now. George, same thing. You you need a greatest hits album, complete best of George Harrison, and McCartney. McCartney's tough. McCartney, I, I can't believe that I actually can't think of anything other than maybe some sort of some sort of live Wings compilation of a lot of Wings material through the years. Um. You know, the 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 the, the Ar McCartney archive box sets have been great and they've been frustrating. They haven't had enough stuff. They've scattered too much stuff in too many places. Download for these. Get the cassette for those. Hmm. Uh, and now all of a sudden. The series has stopped, so I don't know what to make heads or tails out of McCartney, but maybe some sort of live anthology. Of, of the different era, you know, the initial Wings lineup, well, with Henry. And then, you know, the three, it's three periods that they toured. Do something, maybe you want to keep it to Wings, something like that. You're really only missing 79, and you've got some of it on the um, Cambodia album. Yeah, there's not enough of 79. I mean, 76 is covered with Wings Over America, but you could give other... You know, from 75, you know, that, you know, stuff from the 
the Wings Over Europe portion of that mm-hmm. tour could be represented. Uh, there's We now know there's plenty of stuff from 72. So, uh, you know, that might make a nice, nice new archival box set, not reissue of a previously available album. Because, again, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on there. And I would think Paul would want to, you know, there's not a lot of time. You want to get these things, unless they're done and waiting for something. They could, although what did Henry, who said, didn't someone say they have yet to be contacted? Was it Lawrence Huber? Somebody somebody said they have not been contacted about, you know, interviews, interviewed for, um, but I don't know. I, I mean, part of me thinks these box sets might be done and just waiting. Yeah. You know, could be the 79 performances are all going to be in Back to the Egg in the yeah. box set. So, you know, for me, it's easy with Ringo. It's easy for George. What I would want. I'm all right for now with John and Paul. I'm kind of like, I'm not sure what's going on there. It's hard for me to say. So I'll go with like an, a live thing, a live set box set of live can stuff. i add one more thing that i no. completely forgot about yes it's something that we always overlook here we were really blessed for yoko to have the lost linen tapes radio series air when they did right there's a whole bunch of songs there that are unreleased john lennon songs that exist just as demos john on the piano john on acoustic guitar and they've never been released. I mean, some of that stuff has come out. Maybe on the John Lennon anthology that box set, make- you know. Okay. And, um, you know, I'd love to see some kind of a compilation of unreleased John Lennon songs, whether they were finished songs or not. Um, there are various artists out there now that are covering those very songs and putting them out. Maybe there can be some kind of a compilation that Yoko or Sean can authorize of other artists doing all these unreleased John Lennon songs so they can come out there commercially. But I also think that the actual demos should come out. They shouldn't just be lingering out there. You know, it's it's been out on bootleg for many years and um, be nice for something to be done with that. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. If, uh, you know, Yoko gave Paul the cassette for Free as a Bird and Real Love and, well, now we have Now and Then about to come out. And apparently Grow Old With Me was on there. These are all the other songs, too. You know, and they shouldn't be just, um, you know, swept under the carpet there and forgotten about. They should, there should be some kind of nice presentation, maybe all on one CD, all these unreleased John Lennon songs. And uh, if there's more than one take of the same song, and some of those songs there are, have the best take of it. So do something with that. Okay. So shall we consider this a wrap? I think so. I think we've all answered both questions from each of us. So why don't we go around and get contact information and starting with Ken. Okay, if you'd like to email me, my address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on Facebook under Ken Michaels. And speaking of every little thing, if you want to listen to that radio show, which I've been doing now for 41 years on the radio, um, it's on over 50 radio stations. But the easiest way to listen is at one of the radio stations, WFDU, that's Fairleigh Dickinson University Station in New Jersey, they put uh, two of my shows, each an hour in length, uh, on their website, and it's available on demand, so you can listen to the shows whenever you want. It's Beatles, solo Beatles, rarities, thematic sets, interviews, uh, you name it. Um, that's what every little thing is all about. Just go to wfdu.fm, go to the archivals page, type in every little thing, and you'll have two shows there that you can listen to. On my YouTube channel, which is just under the name Ken Michaels Radio, um, I just did a panel discussing what we just talked about in Alan's last question, what Beatle fans want released. And this is a fairly big panel. I had the members of uh, the other talk show podcast that I'm involved with, Talk More Talk, 
a solo Beatles video cast, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo on the show, Andy Nichols, who's part of the Two Legs Paul McCartney podcast with Tom Hunyadi. He joined us for that show. Rick Glover was a part of that. And uh, Rick is part of the Fans on the Run Club, uh, one of a group of people who have seen Paul McCartney in concert more than just about anybody. Um, and Beatley Tone, who's a guy who's been having his own channel on YouTube, all Beatles content, very popular. He's been on for a lot of years um, from England. He was a part of that show. And we all just give our list of what we want to come out with all these rumors that we don't know quite what might be coming out. Um, I thought we should do something on that. Also, um, a musician by the name by the name of Andy Kahn, um, or Kahan, to go either way there. Um, he put out a book a few years ago called The Most Famous Musician You've Never Heard Of. And he's been in the music industry for 60 years. He's worked with so many different people, best known for working with the Turtles and Flo and Eddie from the Turtles, as well as Harry Nilsson. And we talk about his career and his encounters with three of the four Beatles on my channel. And one of my friends to have known now for, well, since the early 80s, Bob Koenig from Long Island. He's a musician who has written an article, see if I can find it here, which is in Retro Fan Magazine. This is the latest issue. He did an article all about what he called Beatles Ploitation. And it's all these albums that came out in the year 1964 in the U.S., exploiting the Beatles name, using the Beatles name sometimes, using their likenesses, uh, drawings of four guys with wigs and, and uh, Beatle haircuts on, all kinds of things from the Chipmunks uh, to uh, a group called the Grasshoppers, um, Beatle Buds, I think is one of them. He talks about all of it in this article and in the show that we did together, and that's at Ken Michaels Radio the name of my channel uh talk more talk a solo beatles video cast is the other podcast that i do um we've been taking a break for this month and we should have a new show coming sometime in september and don't forget there's my website which is kenmichaelsradio.com lots of features on there lots of audio interviews and weekly beatles trivia where you can win one of 10 great prizes and uh one of them which i just put on the page there is um the remastered 33 and a third from George Harrison, along with the McCartney legacy. You can win volume one. So um, again, that's at kenmichaelsradio.com. And I think that's everything. Hey, Darren. Well, I'm at WFUV. We're at 90.7 FM on WFUV.org. We have an app also you could download. That's another way to listen. Um we pride ourselves in playing lots and lots and lots of new music. Um, you can catch me Monday night, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursday nights. I could have probably just said Monday through Thursday nights. It would have been a lot easier. Starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturday afternoons uh, from 1 to 4. Uh, and go to Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. I'm easy to find. Search my name. Uh, join one or both of the pages. I'll invite you to do the other one and you'll we'll be in touch. So that's for me directly. Um, yeah, that's good. That works. That's me. That's you. Okay. And for me, um, you can find me on Facebook. There is also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page and we're on Twitter and things we said today is on Twitter at at things we said fab and you can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com and all of us see that and sometimes we respond sometimes there's no need to but you send us show ideas which we consider and discuss and sometimes do we also have two facebook pages things we said today and things we said today beatles radio fans and Darren will soon make a new one. Someday. Before the <laughs> before the 23rd, what century are we in now? Okay. So that was it. Um, 
longer than I expected it to be. And so was last time. Um, what can you do? You know, it's just fun sitting here yammering on about the Beatles. Uh, we could do it endlessly. Um, so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you next time.